What's going on everybody, it's Charles. This is a W8 engine out of a B5.5 Passat. And I have this engine here today so that we can do a teardown video. The W8 is a four liter V8 engine. And as you'll see in a little bit, it's basically two 15 degree V4 engines mated together at a 72 degree V. Now I got this engine off of Facebook Marketplace. I think it needed chains or something like that. I don't know the whole history. And also big thanks to WD40 brand for partnering with us on this video. Today I'm gonna to be using a bunch of the specialist penetrant with the flexible straw. We're using the penetrant to break up some rust on a handful of fasteners. And I'll be using the specialist silicone to help get some of the stuck hoses and connectors loose. That way we don't end up breaking them. Now, despite being a four liter V8, this engine only had 271 horsepower and about 273 pound-feet of torque, which is crazy by today's standards that we're getting that out of two liter turbo engines. You've probably also heard of some higher line cars having an engine like a W12 or a twin turbo W12 or even the W16. What's cool is those engines are basically just bigger versions of this. Let's go ahead and start with our intake manifold. This is a multi-piece intake manifold that consists of the two tanks on the sides the center section, and there's also another section down on the bottom. What's interesting about this intake manifold is you actually had to take these side tanks off in order to even get access to the ignition coils and the spark plugs. A lot of people really hated this engine because you did have to take a bunch of stuff to do basic maintenance. But once you get a few things out of the way, it really wasn't all that bad to work on. Now, if you'll notice right here and right here, there's two tiny dowels. What would happen is people would take this intake manifold off to do the thermostat, which lays underneath this piece right here. And these dowels would get stuck in the manifold and pop off and fall down into the cylinders, making for a pretty bad day. Also, it looks like we have a uh, injector that the wiring got repaired in. This looks like a factory repair. However, who ever fixed this? Not heat shrink, come on, bro. Let's get some of these connectors and things out of the way. And while I don't really ever plan on reusing any of these connectors, it's always nice to have if you can salvage a wiring harness or parts of a wiring harness to do that. You never know what other car or job or something like that may end up really, really benefiting from you having an extra wire or two. I think broken connectors might be one of the most common issues from like a workmanship of someone else working on a car that, uh, that you could have. This one looks like it's a different injector connector. It is a different injector. It's a different injector. Oh, ah, someone replaced an injector too. I didn't notice this one was green and the rest of them are like gray. Next, we'll remove this lower intake manifold piece. All these little brackets and stuff like this, this is actually awesome stuff to keep. You never know when you might need a little bracket like this for another project. And we have to also pull our fuel rail up and out as well. In fact, I think we gotta do the fuel rail first. These look very similar to the 24 valve VR6 fuel injectors. Couple stayed behind, not a big deal. Is that a piece of, <laughs> it's like a piece of acorn or something in there. No wonder this thing may or may not have ran <laughs> right. Holy cow, full of crud. There was also one injector that the seal, I don't know if you can see that, that seal is just destroyed right there. This one too, look at that, no better. Get our lower manifold piece off. Oof, that is goopy feeling, oh man. So getting this piece of the manifold off is going to expose our thermostat. I would say there's a handful of common failures on this engine. The thermostat is one of them that's, that's kind of high up there. Not hard to replace, but remember, this is way easier the way we have it than it would be if we still had the engine in the car. Go ahead and use our specialist silicone, get this hose sprayed down, this connector here and these two connections here. Next up, we're going to get, I think we'll get this valve cover off here on, this would be the passenger side. We got a bunch of connectors back here. Get these sprayed down. Poor, poor ignition coil harness connectors. The most broken connector in the VW world. Just normal old ignition coils. These were actually pretty good. I, actually, I don't recall ever having to replace one of these ignition coils for being bad. Looks 
all right. Okay, so this is our bank one cylinder head. This is where we're gonna really start to see the similarities between this engine and a VR6 engine. So we have our cam variators back here on the backside, which is similar to the VR6. Two cams, one's gonna be intake, one's gonna be exhaust. But really, not super different from a normal V8. However, when you look at the way the ignition coils go in, you begin to see like something is a little bit goofy with this thing here. Now they did tell me that this engine they thought needed chains, and I'm actually seeing some, some wear marks on the outside of the links right here. We'll take a much closer look at it once we get a few other parts off and the back timing covers off. Also, before I go any further, I'm looking at these flex plate bolts and they're pretty sad. So I'm gonna go ahead and just saturate these guys in our specialist penetrant. That way they have a little bit of time to soak in. Let's get rid of some of this extra stuff that's going on up front. That'll clear out a lot more space for us to actually see what's going on and not be covered up by all these pipes and hoses and wires and all that. This is a combi valve. So this, what this does, is this actually controls part of the secondary air system. Air is pumped into this side vacuum controls this, this valve here, that allows air to pass over the catalytic converter and warms up the catalytic converter faster. This one has two, one on the passenger side bank and one on the driver's side bank. Now, some of this stuff I actually don't care at all if it breaks. However, there are a certain amount of things that I wanna try and retain, like these little wire loom holders here, vacuum line holders here. I wanna try and keep these because these will come in handy in a future project, most likely. Let's get this water pump out of the way here. I'm gonna break these loose with a ratchet because I am very concerned about those bolts rounding out with the triple squares there. Actually came out nice and easy. I'm surprised. This water pump here is driven by the serpentine belt, which is pretty common for these W or V style engines like this. The VR6s are the same way. Woo. Dry as a, <laughs> look at this, ew. Boink. There's our seal and our water pump. Looks pretty crusty in there, but uh, I mean, all the, all the fins are on there, so that's good. Next, let's get our alternator and our oil filter housing off and out of the way. This is actually a really cool alternator setup. It's liquid cooled, so it has coolant running through it. I think once we get the entire rest of the engine disassembled, maybe we'll take that apart so I can show you exactly what's going on in there. The oil filter assembly is kind of a cool setup too. Maybe we'll take both of them apart. We'll see how many years this video lasts before I commit to that. Oh boy. Oh boy. <laughs> there's a lot of stuff down here. Oh, it's heavy. Oh, there's still oil in it. Oh no, I hope that there's not oil in the oil pan. But look at this monstrosity. Oh, it's heavy. I'm gonna go set this over here. It's so drippy. Oh, it's leaking. Oh, word. Oh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. We'll go ahead and get that AC compressor off next. Luckily, this has already been evacuated. Get off me. We can get these guys out of the way. All right, that came off nice and easy. Next up, we're gonna get our crank pulley off. So we're gonna use our Ooh, that's crunchy. <laughs> our holder for, uh, this is actually for our VR6 engine as well. Put that guy on there. That's better. Ooh. Ooh. Oh, 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 good. It looks like. <laughs> Uh, whoa, so I'm guessing, okay, so I, I actually don't know a ton about this failure of this engine. I bought it just because I wanted to do this teardown video for you, and clearly this cover, like this gear right back here, uh, needs to separate from the, the dampener on the front, or damper on the front, probably could have got it off. It looks like you could maybe drop a punch or something in there and tap that loose. Something like that, I'm guessing, because you might be shocked to learn, uh, Volkswagen has a special tool for this. But, check out what I found. So this is a belt, was a belt anyway. Now this belt drives this gear, and this gear is for our balance shafts. This belt is totally shredded. Like, it, it should sit on there like that, and then go around that gear that was on the, uh, the damper. 
but it's completely shredded. There's not a tooth left on it. Holy cow. I, I, I don't even know what to say. Honestly, I'm blown away because I didn't expect to see like any kind of actual failure. This is also locked up mostly. I actually got it to free spin a little bit. So I'm guessing that this probably locked up maybe and just, this is gonna be the tensioner here or this did, holy cow, that's awesome. Wow, okay, well I'm super happy we actually found some kind of issue. I hate that, I hate that I broke that piece, but whatever, ultimately it doesn't matter whatsoever. Take a look, whoa, look at all this crustiness. It looks like it lived in the ocean. Holy cow, <laughs> holy cow, wow. Okay, is that like, what, is there a piece, oh, there's a piece broke, look. There's a chunk broken out of it. I wonder if that chunk is in here somewhere. Well, I found the, uh, I found the teeth of the belt too. All this right up here, that's all the teeth of the belt. Next, we're gonna move around to the back side. And over here, I'm just gonna strip off all the rest of this wiring and any coolant hoses and stuff like that, just to give us a lot more access to the back side. Our timing chains are on the back side of this engine, so we wanna get to that point next. I'm actually gonna be saving this engine harness just in case I need a connector or anything like that. You never know with this kind of stuff, so I usually like to hold on to it. Here's our thermostat right there. Uh, this is, like I said, a kind of a common, somewhat common failure part on this engine anyway. We'll get these two coolant pipes out of the way. We'll get the ignition coils out of the way, the oil filler out of the way, and then we can go ahead and take off this driver's side valve cover. Next, we'll get this flex plate out of the way. Next, let's get our timing covers off. We also need to get our tensioner out over here on this side. Get the passenger side off first. Ooh, oh, forgot I had this tensioner out. <laughs> That's why this guy's all floppy. We'll go ahead and get the one on the driver's side bank next. And finally, our lower cover. There we go. Oh yeah. Oh boy, okay. That's not too bad. Well, here we have our whole timing setup. As you can see, this setup runs three different chains. We have one chain from the crankshaft to this intermediate gear here. The intermediate gear then spawns off a chain to the driver's side bank, which is bank two, and the passenger side bank, which is bank one. There's a tensioner unit here to keep this chain in tension, a tensioner unit here to keep this one, the one from the crank to that intermediate gear tensioned, and then this one over here, this is the one that was held in with that tensioner that we took out a minute ago. So out of like all the crazy VW and more specifically Audi timing chain setups, this one's pretty simple and straightforward. So to kind of compare it with the VR6, it's actually really, really similar. So the VR6 would just be like this way or this way. It wouldn't have to have that extra chain to run the separate bank. Now, before we go any further, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make sure we don't have a whole oil pan full of oil in this thing. It definitely looks like there's some. Hopefully it's not full though. I went ahead and pulled the spark plug, so at least we weren't trying to turn against compression. These are the spark plugs that I found in this engine. I can tell you from experience, for the most part, this brand of plugs rarely makes your Volkswagen run right. Obviously a lot of issues going on with this engine. Let's go ahead and remove some of these chains on our path to getting the cylinder head off. Now, sometimes you can get these chains off. Other times you have to pull the cam off all the way. This one's gonna come off. So there's one chain, two chains. Here's our intermediate gear. The VR6 has the same kind of setup with just one. This one's got a dowel in it, that's cool. Get this guy out of here. This is a pretty cool little necklace if you're into into that kind of thing. We're pretty much stripped down back here. Let's take this little cover off and see what's behind door number this one. This is a balance shaft, but I think we're gonna need a little bit more attention to give to that. Let's go ahead and pull all our main caps off, that way we can get our cams out. Okay, so I wish I was paying closer attention when I was taking all these nuts off. I found, look at the corner of this nut. It looks like the metal's all galled away right there compared to like one that's perfectly round, super weird. I don't see anywhere where it's like, holy crap, that's super obvious. One of our cam bearing journals, it looks okay. 
like there's some little bit of lines in it, but you can't feel anything. It has no soul. All right, that one's got a little bit of texture on it. Just like on the regular VR6s, we're gonna have to take the cam gears off and we're gonna have to take that front bridge with the solenoids off. Oh boy, check this out. These are, this is an oil passage screen that uh, has had part of the screen go rogue. So interesting, interesting kind of thing. That's something super common with like the two liters and that having these screens come out. Let's go ahead and get our head bolts undone next. All right, let's see if we can lift this cylinder head up and back and check out what it looks like down below. There we go. Oh, there went a dowel. Whoa, <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's not supposed to be in the bottom of the cylinder. Here it is, a VR4, essentially, block cylinder head. So much, man, this thing looks like it's been sitting quite some time. There's like sand down in the, <laughs> down in the, in the cylinder. I wonder if these cylinder walls are coated. They look like they're coated with one of those fancy coatings. All right, let's get this head out of the way. Ugh, good thing I'm strong. So we can do a complete tear down. I'm gonna go ahead and remove the other cylinder head as well. It comes off exactly the same as the passenger side cylinder head did. Okay, the cylinder head and airflow design of this engine is actually super cool. The way it works is you actually have two different length intake runners and two different length exhaust runners in the head. That also means you have two different length intake valves and two different length exhaust valve. So these intake valves, the taller ones, are going to be the ones where the intake runner in the cylinder head is much, much longer. So if you have long intake valves for long intake runners, you have short exhaust valves. And then if you have the short intakes, you have the long exhaust, which is pretty cool the way they've essentially balanced out the overall bit of airflow. If it's short in, it's long out. If it's long in, it's short out. That brings up the question, is there different runner lengths for the short intake in the head versus the long intake in the head and the same thing on the exhaust? And as it looks, they're all pretty close to the same length. I also went ahead and put the mount on to put the engine on the engine stand. Now that we have it on the engine stand, I'm gonna flip it over the other way so that we can work on the bottom side. And you can see just how ridiculously huge this engine oil pan is. And anything left in it is gonna drip right out. Let's go ahead and get these 800,000 Allen heads out of the lower oil pan. Now, this is actually a two-part oil pan or you might even be able to call it a three-part oil pan. I, I feel like it's more of a two-part oil pan with a lower part of the block, but it's really interesting how this bottom end is set up. What? Okay, well, here is our oil pump exposed another 100,000 <laughs> Allen heads. Uh, interesting, so this is where our dipstick funnel goes in, so our dipstick tube would be right here. This is our oil pump. It looks like the oil pump is chain driven off directly off of the crank gear. You know it's a weird day when you need a 14 millimeter socket working on Volkswagen Audi. There's not a whole lot of those <laughs> floating around. Banjo bolts, so this must be some kind of little transfer pipe. That's cool. Let's take our oil pickup off and see what it looks like. A lot of times this is a place where junk will get caught up in here and it'll clog and cause low oil pressure. This one looks pretty good. Next, I'm gonna try and take this upper oil pan off. So we had the pan that covered here and then we have this whole other big section that I'm gonna take off next. Kind of like that lower pan, there's a ton of Allens that need to come out. Okay, that one's got a metal gasket. Wow, 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 wow. Look, look at this enormous piece, it's huge. How cool is that though? Here's what you see from the top side. Now, let's see if we can get this oil pump out. So here's our oil pump, wow. This is uh, quite, quite a healthy 
size piece here. Doesn't look like it was locked up. I've heard that oil pumps locking up can actually cause the balance shafts to lock up, which could lead to that belt that we saw earlier being shredded, but this one looks pretty good. Now we have this like lower block girdle piece that we need to get out of here. And there's a another just round of ton of bolts that need to come out. We'll go ahead and uh, take these out. That is a lot of bolts. Now we have these little retainers here too. These are cool. We'll be keeping these for some kind of fun project. Let's uh, nurse this apart a little bit. Ah, oh, there we go. Okay, here we go. Oh my gosh, this is heavy. Holy cow. Wow, all right. Ugh. So <laughs> this piece is enormous. Here's our balance shaft. It's not seized. I wonder if we can get it out. I think we're gonna need to love that out with a hammer, but wow. So this is our bearing girdle. This is where our, this holds our, uh, our crankshaft in. Actually, they're not bad. They don't look great, but they're not bad. Y'all, this thing is huge and heavy. <laughs> wow, okay. We'll set that guy on the ground. All right, so we have our whole bottom end. We rotate our crankshaft around. Looks really cool. Uh, let's keep going. We also have here our balance shaft. It actually doesn't feel like it's seized at all. Like maybe we were thinking earlier and the bearings look pretty good in it. So I'm not sure what happened with that belt. Let's go ahead and unbolt all of our connecting rods so we can get our pistons out. Man, the bearings actually look like they have a tiny bit of wear on them, nothing major. But boy, look at how narrow, <laughs> they're crazy narrow, especially when you look to compare them to like what the, uh, what the R32 engine is. I'll actually walk over there and compare them um, now. All right, back to getting these guys out. What's really cool is look at how the journals for the connecting rods are offset like that. So even though they're on like kind of the same journal spacing, they're definitely not on the same timing type issue, which is really, really cool. Oh my God, like this is the shortest crankshaft in the world. Holy cow. I wish I had another crankshaft from like a four cylinder out so we could do a direct comparison. But I mean, this is so, so short. Here we have our crankshaft. Now, the first thing you're gonna notice, and it's like blowing my mind right now, is how short the crankshaft is. This W design or two Vs in a V design allows us to take that engine, you know, if it were a normal V8 and push it considerably shorter. And that's really cool. Now that does come with some sacrifice, of course, but it allows for a really, really compact eight cylinder engine. Other than the size of it, the thing that I find really, really interesting is the way that the connecting rods mount and the connecting rod journals are. Normally, if this were say a four cylinder engine, this section right here would be a connecting rod journal. And if you'll notice the lobes are offset or the journals are offset, it would be all just one round piece. And that would be where our connecting rod bolted on. But with this offset piece here, it allows us to have one connecting rod like this and one connecting rod like this. And the two of them now are not necessarily timed together. So they're not really companion cylinders. That alone is what allows us to crunch that down. So you don't have to have either one full big journal for each of the connecting rods, or you don't have one journal that's all like one round piece that two connecting rods ride on. So this allows us to change the time of the way when the pistons go up and down. And it's super duper cool and crazy compact. And boy, if you're the type of person that makes art with crankshafts, this one would be one that I don't think most people would catch how cool it is. What a cool looking, uh, looking block setup with the pistons and the connecting rods, kind of the way they fold over each other. Really, really neat. This one also does have the oil jets that squirt oil back to the backside of the, the piston. Let's go ahead and take a piston out though. Oh, I dropped it. Okay, so here we have our piston and boy, look at how much carbon is built up on the piston and in the rings. This oil ring, wow, is, uh, is pretty clogged up. Just like all the other VR6s, is not a flat top cut piston. It's got, uh, this side sticks up higher than the other side. And so, yeah, that's a thing. All right, our block is basically stripped 
completely down. We have a handful more parts like these bearings in here and this balance shaft, but I'm gonna go ahead and leave that in there for now. There's not much to see on it here beyond that. Now, it's actually a pretty lightweight block too. I wish I had a scale to measure it. Okay, so that is a W8 engine. Two VR4s put in another V, 15 degrees on the VR4 side, and then 72 degrees in the center V. Now, I think I'm actually gonna keep this intake manifold. Maybe I'll powder coat it and hang it up on the wall. It makes kind of cool wall art. The rest of it, it's probably gonna go to the metal recycler, other than the block. Somebody called dibs on that guy. So it's going to be made into some kind of table or something cool. So I'm gonna wrap it up there. Hey, big thanks to WD-44 partnering with us in this video. Without them, I don't know that I actually could have made this happen. So with that, I'm out. Have an awesome day, and I'll talk to you again next time. By the way, if you want to see a teardown of the transmission that came out of this car, I also have that. So let me know. It's a lot more parts and probably a way bigger mess.